Happy Sunday to you. I'm glad that you're joining with me here at the pool this morning. I'm actually recording this on a Saturday night. It's dark outside. It's about 830. And uh, so it's kind of strange talking about it being morning when I look outside as I do this in one of the classrooms upstairs in the chapel building and I see nothing but dark. Today we're going to talk about a couple of big words. We're going to talk about sincere and insincere. And so what kind of worshiper, follower of God, do you think God wants us to be? Do you think he wants us to be insincere or to be sincere? Excuse me, I've got a tickle in my throat suddenly. Now, it probably would help me or help you if I told you what those words meant, didn't I? And I have a feeling that once I start describing them, you're going to know very well what it means to be sincere and insincere. Let's, let's pray. And then I'm going to start out by telling you a story. And you tell me whether you think it's a silly story or a non-silly story. But let's pray first. Lord God, I do thank you for this day. I thank you that we can come before you and that we can be in your presence. I thank you for everybody that watches this video. I pray that, uh, Lord, you would help us learn to worship you exactly the way that you want us to. We pray this in your name, Jesus. Amen. All right. So I, as I told you, it's night outside. It's getting dark. It won't be long before I want to go to bed. And so I'll take off the clothes that I have, my pool shirt I'll hang up in the closet so it doesn't get all wrinkled. The rest will go in the dirty clothes. I'll put on my pajamas. I'll go into the bathroom. And when I go in the bathroom, I will brush my teeth. I'll get out my toothbrush. I'll open up the, the toothpaste and I'll pour some spaghetti sauce on it. And then I will start brushing my... Wait, what do you mean? Oh, you don't use spaghetti sauce? I thought everybody used spaghetti sauce to brush their teeth. And you know, that nice red color, then it covers up everything in your mouth. No? You think I'm being silly? That's right, I am. And really, that's what it means to be insincere. It means to be silly about the wrong things. When you're sincere, you're serious, you're focused on what's right. When you're insincere, you are not focused on what is right. Maybe sometimes you go to school and, and there will be somebody in class that's trying to be funny. And so they're making jokes at the wrong time or they're, they're distracting people at the wrong time. All in an effort to draw attention to themselves rather than on the teacher or on the work where it needs to be. Well, insincere means that when we, we approach something, we're not approaching it with the right heart, with the right attitude. God wants us to be sincere worshipers of his. He wants us, when, when we come before him, when we are in his presence, and when aren't we in his presence, we're always in his presence. He, want us to, he wants us to be sincere about it. Let me ask you a question. Maybe this will help a little bit. Has there been a time where mom or dad have asked you to do something and you're standing right in front of them, but you're not hearing a word of it because your focus is elsewhere? Your thoughts are elsewhere. Maybe you're thinking about a friend that you want to go play with or a video game you want to play or whatever it might be. And so mom or dad finishes what they're saying and you realize you didn't hear any of it. And so you have to ask them, what'd you say? Because you weren't sincerely listening. You were insincerely listening. And so, and that happens to all of us. We all make that choice sometimes to not listen or to not focus. You know, sometimes we'll go, go to church and instead of singing the songs, we'll be thinking about what I should have eaten for breakfast or what I'm going to do this afternoon or maybe what's for lunch. There are times where we don't 
pay attention though to what Pastor Charles has to say, do we? You know, one of our pool rules is respect. And why is that? Because is sometimes we're more interested in what our neighbor has to say than what the lesson is. There are times where we, we think we've heard the lesson before. And because we think we've heard it, we stop listening. And when we stop listening, we become an insincere worshiper of God. Well, today... Oh, wait, I, I want to... If you have your Bible with you... We're going to flip over to Hebrews for just a minute before we get back to our story in John. But Hebrews is towards the back of the Bible. Remember, the Bible's divided up into two parts. That first two-thirds is called the Old Testament. That final third, that last part, is called the New Testament. And it begins with the story of Jesus' life. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John tell us about that. Then we have Acts, Romans, 1st and 2nd Corinthians, Galatians, Ephesians, Philippians, Colossians, 1st and 2nd Thessalonians, 1st and 2nd Timothy, Titus, Philemon. Then comes Hebrews. And then just to show you how close we are to the end, we have James, 1st and 2nd Peter, 1st, 2nd, 3rd John, Jude, Revelation. So turn almost to the end, and you should be somewhere near Hebrews. Hebrews chapter 10. And this tells us what God wants us to do. Hebrews 10, 22 says, Let us draw near to God with a sincere heart in full assurance of faith. Let us draw near to God with a sincere heart and full assurance of faith. So let us draw near to God with our focus, our minds, our thoughts being totally on him with that full assurance that we're saved by the blood of Jesus through his death and his resurrection. I can be close to God. All right, so... John, Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, John chapter 2. In John chapter 2, we're going to meet some people that were insincere in their worship of God. All right, so John chapter 2, verse 13. And do you know, if you ever are turning to something and you're not quite there yet, and I start talking, you can always pause me. And that way it gives you time to get to where you need to be rather than me getting ahead of you. Because I have no way of checking to see if you have already gotten to John chapter 2. So whenever you need to, feel free to pause. John 2, beginning in verse 13. When it was almost time for the Jewish Passover, Jesus went up to Jerusalem. In the temple courts, he found men selling cattle, sheep, doves, others sitting at tables exchanging money. So he made a whip out of cords and drove all, and drove all from the temple area, both sheep and cattle. He scattered the coins and the money changers and overturned their tables. To those who sold doves, he said, get these out of here. How dare you turn my father's house into a market? His disciples remembered that it is written, Zeal for your house will consume me. Then the Jews demanded of him, What miraculous sign can you show us to prove your authority to do all this? Jesus answered them, Destroy this temple. I will raise it again in three days. The Jews replied, It's taken 46 years to build this temple, and you are going to raise it in three days? But you see, the temple he'd spoken of was his body, and he was raised from the dead. His disciples recalled what he had said. Or, I'm sorry, after he was raised from the dead, his disciples recalled, they remembered what he had said. Then they believed the scripture and the words that Jesus had spoken. Do you ever get angry? I have, I have some things before me. You know, there are times where, where I get angry. And, and sometimes in my anger, I do the wrong thing. And, and I throw the pencil down. 
Now, when I got angry and I threw the pins down, what was my anger focused on? It was focused on me. I wanted to throw the pins down, so I threw the pins down. Well, Jesus, he comes into the temple. And in order to understand this story, you have to understand that the temple was divided up into several parts. At the far end of the temple was what was called the Holy of Holies. And the high priest would go into the Holy of Holies once a year on the Day of Atonement to atone, to make right for the sins, for his sins, for the sins of his family, for the sins of Israel. Well, outside of that was the, the, the courtyard, the temple area for the Jewish men. And, and that's where the priests and, and the Jewish men would go in and they would make their sacrifices and, and, and catch the blood and they would put the, the, the blood and the parts of the animal on the altar and they would offer that to the Lord. Outside of that was the courtyard of the Jewish women. Outside of that was another courtyard. It was called the courtyard of the Gentiles. And there was a wall between the courtyard of the Gentiles. Whoa, was I hit the table? The courtyard of the Gentiles and the courtyard of the women. And on that wall that separated them was a, a sign that said, no Gentiles beyond this point, or you'll be put to death. We've actually, we being archaeologists, have actually found parts of that sign that, that said that, that Jewish people only could go into the courtyard of the women and of the men. And so if you were what's called a God follower, you weren't born Jewish, and you hadn't become a, a Jewish follow, uh, 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 you hadn't committed to becoming Jewish, then you were what's called a God follower. And the only area that you could come and worship God in was that courtyard, that, te that temple area of the Gentiles. Well, Jesus, as he goes into that area, he sees that that area, it's full of sheep, it's full of cattle and doves, and, and there's money changers sitting at tables exchanging the currency uh, throughout the Roman Empire into the Jewish temple money. Well, imagine being... A Gentile and you come up to worship God and the only place that you can worship God is in this area and there's there's cattle over here and there are doves over here and there's there's men trying to get the attention of others so that they can exchange their money it's not a quiet place it's a hard place to focus on God it's a it's a hard place to be sincere not only is it hard for you but it's also hard for all of those merchants, those that had brought in the, the, the cattle and the doves and the goats and the money changers, it's hard for them to worship God sincerely too because they're trying to make money. Their focus is not on God in this area for the Gentiles. Their focus is on making money. They've arrived with an insincere heart because of where their focus is. And so Jesus, as he sees all of this, he takes some cord and he makes a whip. And Jesus, he gets angry. But his anger is not causing him to sin because his anger is not focused on him. His anger is focused on those that would come to God's house and to worship God that aren't able to. And so he drives out everybody that has no business being there. So that those that had a sincere heart, those that wanted to come and to focus on God, that they could. The Jewish leaders, the, the, the religious leaders, when they, they see this, they want to know 
what Jesus can do to prove his authority. By whose authority do you do this? Give us some sign. Give us a reason to believe you. And Jesus said that he would give them a sign. That sign would be that if they were to destroy this temple, and he's meaning his body, that three days later, it'll come back to life. He'll rise from the dead. Well, all that they can think of is this magnificent stone structure that's all around them that's, that, that's been, been, been worked on for the last 46 years and will be worked on for another 30 plus years. And, and, and so their focus is on, not on God. Their focus is not on the words of Jesus. Their focus is on things. And you and I, we need to make sure that when we focus, our focus is not on things, but it's rather on God. I want us to flip over a few chap or a few, yeah, a few pages to the book of Matthew. So the first book of the New Testament, Matthew 15. Do you know what? It isn't Matthew 15. Hmm. Let me see if I can find it real quick again. Oh, maybe it is. You're right. It is Matthew 15, verse 16. Jesus is talking to his disciples. He's, he's told them a story and they didn't understand it. And so he says to them, Don't you see that whatever enters the mouth goes into the stomach and then comes out of the body? But the things that come out of the mouth come from the heart, and these make a man unclean. So what we want to do when we come to worship God, we want to worship God with a sincere heart. We want the things that are coming out of our mouth, the things, the actions that we're doing, we want all of those to reflect our trust, our belief, our faith, <coughs> in God, in Jesus, for the forgiveness of our sins. And so the next several weeks, we're going to be spending some time as we approach Easter, what it means to be a Christ follower as Jesus prepares himself and those around him for his death and his resurrection. We see that the first thing when we come to worship Jesus, we need to come with a sincere heart, our Focus needs to be on him. Now, I don't know if you'll be watching part of the worship service next or, or what your plan is, but I would encourage you to, to, with your family, spend some time following God, seeking God sincerely. Maybe it's in praying together. Maybe it's in reading some of the stories from the, the Gospels. Maybe it's in committing to, to do something together, uh, an action. Maybe it's to be nice, to be kind. Whatever it is, I, I want you to remember that we worship God with a sincere heart. Let's pray. Lord God, I just pray in this day and in this week that you would help us to come before you with sincere hearts, that our, our focus would be on you and you alone, and that, that Lord, we wouldn't get be distracted by the things around us. Lord, we just pray this in your name. Amen. I hope that you have a good day and a good week, and I, I look forward to the day that, that we can be together again. Have a good day.